for for bombay dm we don't have any exam in december correct there is nothing like uh, no sir one the, no no if the student has not given the exam due to ineligibility or uh, due uh-huh. to a term lapse or if uh, in case of a failure then they have a exam of so we also months. have a this thing okay. yeah yeah only in those uh, special scenarios okay regular batches will be in june around june, june and uh, practicals so, around july end or august okay 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 good good to know good but for you guys i am informed that jj is not a covid hospital correct Ah, uh, JJ was not a COVID hospital uh, any times actually. Both Saint George and uh, GT Hospital they were completely okay. COVID hospitals. Okay, they come okay. under JJ, so we were supposed ah, to go and work there. Yeah. So good. And we had a suspect ward. So before admitting in JJ, we used to admit in a suspect ward at JJ. There are four different wards, and uh, if the patient turns to be positive, then they were uh, sent to either Delhi or um, Saint George. Yeah, that that is a big advantage, isn't it? That we have. Yeah. And and we also have Kama Hospital for the gynec, mm-hmm. so three hospitals under. But but Kama Kama was mainly obstetrics, correct? Now they, did they convert that into COVID as well? No, sir. It is for obstetrics, but uh, jo uh, JJ patients, COVID positive uh, pregnant patients or gynec patients, they were sent to Kama. So Kama Somebody. was also like a COVID hospital. Yeah. COVID. Uh, so all three of them antinatal. were COVID hospitals. Right. Mm-hmm. That, that's a very good thing for JJ. So they segregate. Yeah, exactly. So we could have some patients in between, few patients, uh, normal non-COVID patients. Also, we had. So then, what what happened to the COVID strokes? They went under uh, COVID and cephalitis or something. Uh, so actually, sir, uh, many times what happened is we actually thrombolyzed all uh, COVID strokes in JJ itself before the report would uh, come. So it happened in many cases. But okay. they were always kept in a segregated ward, separate ward. Mm. So we could transfer them to JJ uh, Saint George after the reports come. After the reports come. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We got a lot of uh, stroke patients in between because of the private hospitals were turned into COVID. So many stroke COVID, patients yeah. were coming primarily to JJ in the yeah, therapeutic yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Good. So I think for for uh, Saraswati and all, I don't know. Saraswati, did you have? Do you have a COVID ward in Nimans or yeah. there's no COVID? There's separate building, sir. There's COVID uh, ward and ICU in a separate building. COVID. Do you have uh, COVID, COVID thing? Separate. Okay, okay, okay. Not many <laughs> patients now, sir. It has come down significantly. No, no, that is okay. But in spite of being a neurology neuroscience institute, you still had to dedicate one building for this thing. Uh, during new building is in is converted. There was a new building for subspeciality. It is converted mm-hmm. to COVID now. But then, but then, who came and worked the MD medicine people came and worked there. What? How did they do it? Or you? You were deputed there. Uh, our uh, our residents only, sir. DM residents only. Oh God! Yeah, the same thing everywhere. Yeah. But there are neurological cases, mostly neurology only. Neurology with uh, general medicine or pure neurology like that. So. Pure neurology. No, for us actually, what happened is because at Dinana, the one whole building was given away to COVID, which is around four and a half, four fifty patients and four thirty, okay. and with with three ICUs, COVID ICUs functioning, many of the MD chairs. and even some md medicine people became dedicated for the you know the junior md they became suddenly dedicated for icu and so they fell short of um, md medicine all of us neurologists were made to work in covid wards for one week rotas every fourth fifth week we used to have it's a care also senior most but even we were made to work there mm-hmm. so we had enormous crunch of you know the what we would say md medicine and obli md chess people serious crunch there was all super specialist work ha ah, yes same in government medical college also so they are mm, we all work 
all the super specialities were posted they posted them to wards and they kept the anesthetists and the medicine for icus some absolutely that same same with our hospital same only fortunate thing i feel now is we have two separate buildings if it was one it would have been a chaos really and there was no way to segregate them that that was the only good part but i am hearing now the patients are rising yes in mumbai they are rising right. yeah in mumbai they are rising and uh, they are planning to keep a uh, chembur area specifically yeah i know uh, all this local train starting complete mix up i think let's begin we have our around 40 pgs have already joined our this thing so good uh, another fine evening tutorials evening here today good evening everybody and uh, we continue our education and as you can see on the screen we have our second module on neuromuscular diseases and today as you many of most of you may be aware my first two lectures we have chosen clinical scenarios and the other two obviously are in the investigation area uh, as it would be divided in your theory papers and they are very important topics and i have been through the papers and they have been they have appeared frequently in your uh, exams and i hope you find the session useful the first one is lent dependent neuropathies would be delivered by dr madhu who most of you very likely must be knowing who is an additional professor at nimhans and uh, it's going to be a very useful lecture for you uh this particular topic would be useful not only for your theories but also when you presenting a case when time would come you are expected to discuss and dissect out what type of neuropathy you are presenting so i consider it very important and i request dr madhu to do start a lecture madhu Uh, good evening are you able to hear me yes uh good evening to all i thank the organizers for providing this opportunity to take the class on length dependent neuropathies the topic as you know is past uh, your video can you start please it's on uh, and see ah yeah okay yeah are you able to see Yeah, yes. so thank you for this opportunity to uh, speak on uh, length dependent uh, polyneuropathies. The topic as you know is uh, quite vast. One could conduct a whole day CME and yet not cover the breadth and depth of this uh, topic. But still uh, today we'll uh, cover this length dependent neuropathies in a succinct and uh, crisp manner which will help you to answer a 10 mark question should it turn up in the exams. So length dependent polyneuropathy i mean uh, neuropathy is as you know refers to disorders of the peripheral nerves and uh, neuropathy is uh, one of the most common uh, neurological condition in the community as well as in the specialist setting it is one of the uh, top 5 reasons for consulting a neurologist the prevalence is even higher in the elderly which predisposes them to falls and uh, sustaining injuries there are different patterns of neuropathy polyneuropathy or a length dependent neuropathy or a distal symmetrical polyneuropathy is the most common pattern the other patterns are mononeuropathy mononeuritis multiplex radicular neuropathy and plexopathy a combination of these patterns also can can occur for diseases uh, i mean diseases of the peripheral nerve the diseased peripheral nerves are prone to entrapment or compression and hence a mononeuropathy may be superimposed on a polyneuropathy for instance a patient may have carpal tunnel syndrome that is superimposed on a diabetic polyneuropathy 
Before we go into the pathophysiological uh, mechanisms, let us uh, take a brief overview of the normal physiology of the axon. The peripheral nerves, as you know, are uh, nothing but bundles of nerve fibers or uh, axons that uh, uh, come from the cell body of the neuron. Now, these axons contain longitudinally oriented uh, neurons. filaments and microtubules, static structures, rather they're highly dynamic. It would be useful for you to draw these line diagrams so as to uh, illustrate this uh, um, structure of the axon, which would make your answer more attractive in the exam. So these uh, structures within the axon, uh, they take part in transporting various molecules from the cell body to the axon terminal and back to the cell body. Andrograde transport refers to transfer of molecules from the nerve cell body to the axon terminal. And among the various functions, the most important is the renewal of the membrane and neurotransmitter systems that helps in maintaining the health of the axon. Whereas retrograde transport is the reverse, it is the transport of molecules from the distal axon terminal back to the cell body, which gives a feedback to the cell bodies to uh, adjust the metabolic activity and thereby modulate the production of various proteins, growth factors and other materials that are required for maintaining the health of the axon, including the axonal regeneration. So in pathological conditions, there is a failure to synthesize the axon because of which there is impaired axonal function. This manifests as a dying back phenomenon because of which the distal most part of the axon is first affected. This pathological process then progresses proximally and the functional impairment is proportionate to the size and length of the dysfunctional axons. Now the etiologies of the polyneuropathy are several. Diabetes is undoubtedly the most common cause of polyneuropathy, both in the community setting as well as in the hospital setting. Apart from these, there are other metabolic and endocrine causes. The etiologies can be broadly classified as toxic causes, nutritional deficiencies, infections, immune-mediated causes, inherited causes, and other miscellaneous causes that include critical illness, polyneuropathy, familial amyloid polyneuropathy, and others. Despite all the workup, about one third of the patients uh, do not have a cause for the polyneuropathy. They are uh, labeled as having chronic idiopathic axonal polyneuropathy, which incidentally is the second most common uh, cause after diabetes. But one must remember that there can be multiple conditions that may contribute to polyneuropathy in a given subject. You see diabetes, thyroid dysfunction, alcohol consumption are rather common in the community. And the occurrence of neuropathy in this setting does not necessarily imply a causal association. So clinically relevant co-occurrences include CIDP in the setting of diabetes mellitus or HIV infection. And rarely an acquired cause such as CIDP may be superimposed on a genetic cause of neuropathy such as uh, Charcot-Marie Tooth disease. So neuropathy may present with a variety of symptoms and signs that can broadly be classified as positive or negative symptoms. Positive symptoms reflect inappropriate spontaneous nerve activity, whereas negative symptoms reflect the reduced nerve activity. Positive symptoms may present, particularly positive sensory symptoms may present early on in the disease course. And the length-dependent polyneuropathy classically presents with the uh, distal predominant neuropathy, wherein the symptoms start at the toes and then they progress proximally in a graded manner. That is, the symptoms are more severe distally and less severe proximally. And when the symptoms start in the feet, which are supplied by the longest axons, they ascend. And after they reach the knees, the fingertips are affected. And the more proximal portions, such as the forearms and the anterior portion of the trunk, may also be affected. So this is called as a stalking love pattern of involvement. There can also be a coexisting radiculopathy or a mononeuritis multiplex that is superimposed on the polyneuropathy. One must also remember that a severe form of mononeuritis multiplex may become confluent, which resembles a polyneuropathy. So it is important to inquire regarding the onset of symptoms, whether there was asymmetry or the exact site of onset of symptoms, because the etiological causes of mononeuritis multiplex are far fewer and more easier to work up as compared to the polyneuropathy. Coming to some of the uh, symptoms and signs that can be seen in these patients, the positive sensory symptoms include burning or lancinating pain, tingling paresthesias, pins and needle sensations, etc. 
Negative sensory symptoms include impaired sensation or loss of sensation to uh, touch, pain, temperature, and they may also have difficulty in walking that is called a sensory ataxia. Patients have imbalance which is percent in the dark, that is when the visual input is not able to compensate for the impaired kinesthetic sense. Negative motor symptoms include weakness and wasting. And uh, because it's a, a length dependent pattern, the feet, the toes are first affected. The weakness may not be appreciated till at least 50 to 80% of the nerve fibers become dysfunctional. So the intrinsic foot muscles are first affected, resulting in toe scraping, and then the anterior tibial uh, compartment is affected, leading to anterior ankle dorsiflexor weakness. This manifests as uh, twisting at ankles and a uh, foot drop, etc. Weakness of the hands is manifest as change in handwriting, difficulty in fastening jewelry or buttons, turning keys in the locks, or difficulty in opening jars or bottles. The positive motor symptoms include cramps, twitching of muscles or fasciculations, and myokinia. Symptoms that indicate autonomic nervous uh, uh, system dysfunction include uh, orthostatic intolerance, uh, sicca symptoms, altered sweating, bloating, vomiting sensation, early satiety, erectile dysfunction. And the patients with vasomotor instability may have cold extremities associated with alterations in skin color and trophic changes. Various studies have shown that the history and examination established the etiology in vast majority of patients with the lab investigations contributing to an additional 10 to 15% of the diagnosis. But with all the workup, about one third of these patients remain undiagnosed and these are referred to as having chronic idiopathic axonal polyneuropathy. Uh, so we take clues from the uh, clinical uh, 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 scenario, that is the history and examination in order to arrive at the etiology. So details regarding the disease onset, the duration of symptoms and the course are quite important for characterizing the neuropathy and narrowing down the etiology. In the setting of neuropathy, acute neuropathy refers to progression of up to four weeks. Subacute refers to progression of four to eight weeks, whereas chronic refers to progression of symptoms beyond eight weeks. So acute or subacute neuropathy may be seen in the setting of immune-mediated disorders like vasculitis, GBS, and uh, toxin or drug expo uh, uh, drug-induced neuropathies. Whereas a more chronic form of neuropathy may be seen with metabolic causes, nutritional deficiencies, paraneoplastic neuropathies, and uh, inherited neuropathies. Also, the tempo of progression, that is, uh, whether it's a monophasic course, a steadily progressive course, or a relaxing remitting course also has to be uh, taken into consideration while uh, narrowing the differential diagnosis. Depending upon the symptomatology, one can uh, identify the fibers that are predominantly affected. Majority of the polyneuropathies uh, are mixed, but uh, they may affect one fiber type more than the other. So uh, neuropathies with uh, predominantly sensory or purely sensory neuropathies include metabolic causes such as diabetes, mellitus, vitamin deficiencies, and uh, toxic causes. Whereas those with predominant motor involvement in, with uh, wasting and skeletal deformities include uh, hereditary motor neuropathy, hereditary motor sensory neuropathies. Now autonomic dysfunction may be a component of generalized polyneuropathy, or it may be a predominantly autonomic neuropathy. So when autonomic symptoms predominate, one considers a diagnosis of diabetes, amyloid neuropathy, etc. And specifically, one has to mention uh, thickened nerves, which give clues to specific etiologies such as leprosy, demyelinating type of neuropathy such as CIDP and Charcot-Marie 2 disease and uh, amyloid polyneuropathy. As in the case of any other neurological uh, disorder, it is important to look at the other sides of neuraxis, which may further give clues to the underlying etiology. So cranial nerve assessment includes uh, looking for anosmia, which may uh, be a manifestation of resistance disease or vitamin B12 deficiency. Optic atrophy may be seen in a certain nutritional deficiencies and uh, uh, Charcot-Marie tooth disease type 2 due to mitofusin uh, mutation. Facial weakness in case of uh, sarcoidosis and GDS and trigeminal neuropathy in Nachogren syndrome. Other neuraxis involvement such as pyramidal, coexisting pyramidal science and ataxia may give clue to complicated HMSN and other etiologies. Now, medical history should focus on medical conditions that uh, predispose to neuropathy or which may be the etiological cause of neuropathy, such as uh, diabetes, renal insufficiency, hepatic dysfunction, and other connective tissue or vasculitic disorders. 
um, a family history or a childhood history of clumsiness or slowness or poor athletic performance coupled with the foot deformities may give the clue for an underlying HMSA. Social history, including occupational history and substance abuse may uh, provide the setting for toxic neuropathy. And likewise, dietary history has to be taken, which may give a clue for nutritional deficiencies. Examination of skin and mucosae may uh, uncover the skin rashes of vasculitis, uh, POM syndrome, hypopigmented patches of leprosy, etc. The list is quite exhaustive. Here, only the few important points are provided in this slide. So alopecia may be a feature of thallium poisoning. Tight curly hair is seen in giant axon and neuropathy. Maze lines are seen in arsenic and thallium poisoning. And of course, skeletal deformities like pescavus, hamatose, and kyphoscoliosis are important clues for underlying hereditary motor sensory neuropathy. The differential diagnosis include other element conditions like distal myopathies, progressive muscular atrophy, and rare distal forms of spinal muscular atrophy. One must also remember that CNS conditions like uh, myelopathy, multiple sclerosis, uh, in their phase of evolution may sometimes mimic neuropathy, but the pattern of weakness and sensory deficit should help to differentiate between neuropathy and uh, the other uh, conditions. Uh, history and examination uh, provide a clue for localization as well as the etiology. But nerve conduction study is an extension of the clinical examination. It helps to confirm the neuropathy. It helps to exclude other mimickers of neuropathy. And it also provides a better idea about the type of fibers that are affected. And it predicts the pathology as well. It helps to quantify the severity of neuropathy. And when it is performed serially, it helps in uh, uh, following up the patient with respect to worsening of the neuropathy or uh, for biopsy if it is required. But one must remember that this nerve conduction study is useful for assessing large fiber neuropathy. It does not help in identifying purely or predominant small fiber neuropathy. The number of laboratory tests are quite huge. It is challenging to choose which laboratory test has to be performed. But the American Academy of Neurology has provided some broad guidelines. And as per the AN practice parameters, the complete blood count, ESR, blood glucose, renal and liver function tests, and thyroid function tests, vitamin B12, and uh, protein immunofixation are uh, recommended in all patients with uh, uh, length-dependent polyneuropathy because these tests have got the highest diagnostic yield. But of course, the tests have to be tailored according to the clinical situation. And depending upon the um, uh, index of suspicion, uh, the appropriate vasculitic workup, workup for sarcoidosis, underlying infections, paraneoplastic causes, or a toxic screen may need to be performed in the patients. CSF generally is not very contributory in this setting, but when inflammatory or infectious causes are suspected, then it is indicated. The presence of albuminocytological dissociation indicates an immune-mediated disorder. Presence of pleocytosis may point towards an underlying infection. Peripheral nerve imaging is uh, an important test with the advancement of technology. The magnetic resonance imaging and high resolution ultrasound have emerged as very important tools in the workup of any patient with neuropathy. While nerve conduction study provides the functional um, uh, connectivity of the nerves, the uh, peripheral nerve imaging gives information regarding the anatomical or morphological alterations in the peripheral nerves in the form of increased cross-sectional area or diameter, depending upon the um, whether it is measured in one-dimensional or two-dimensional plane or three-dimensional plane. Altered signal intensities increase vascularity and abnormal enhancement. These are used, uh, generally useful in the setting of demyelinating neuropathies. Genetic testing is most effective and efficient when it is uh, tailored to the clinical presentation, the inheritance pattern, and uh, the electrophysiological findings. So in patient with uh, inherited demyelinating neuropathy, the most common cause is copy number variation in the PNP22 gene. So one would like to look for duplication in PNP22 gene. And if it is negative, one may look for uh, uh, mutations in the other genes. Likewise, uh, axonal neuropathy is most commonly caused by mutations in the mitofusin 2 gene. Of course, if there are specific phenotypes that point towards uh, specific uh, conditions such as familial amyloid polyneuropathy, then one could do the uh, specific genetic testing for the uh, corresponding genes. 
Otherwise, the next generation sequencing is the recommended test, which helps in sequencing a large number of genes parallelly, and which is cost effective and uh, uh, less time consuming as compared to sequential evaluation of multiple genes. Historically, nerve biopsy was used to assess the etiology and the severity of neuropathy, but now with the advancement in uh, immunological testing, genetic testing, uh, this nerve biopsy is uh, reserved only for certain specific conditions when other tests do not provide a clue for the etiology. It is generally not um, indicated in patients with uh, length-dependent polyneuropathy because it does not distinguish the most common causes such as the toxic metabolic causes. But if an underlying inflammatory condition, vasculitis or amyloidosis is considered, then nerve biopsy is definitely indicated because it may be diagnostic. Generally, the sural nerve, the superficial peroneal nerve or the superficial radial nerves are chosen for biopsy. In the setting of if vasculitis is suspected, then a triple biopsy with the superficial peroneal nerve, the peroneus muscle and the overlying skin has got a higher yield as compared to a nerve biopsy alone. If amyloid neuropathy is suspected, then aspiration of abdominal fat pad may be useful. There are specific tests for uh, small fiber neuropathy. Autonomic function tests may be complementary, and they include evaluation of the, the cardiovascular systems, the pseudomotor system, and the, the other axis of uh, the autonomic uh, nervous system. The intraepidermal nerve fiber density is a highly specific test. It is a gold standard for the diagnosis of small fiber neuropathy. While it helps in uh, diagnosing or excluding the um, small fiber neuropathy, it may not always provide the etiology. Etiology still comes from the other lab workup. Now, the treatment can broadly be divided into three sections. One is the disease specific, that is depending upon the underlying etiology, the metabolic or under endocrine causes. Familial amyloid polyneuropathy has specific uh, treatment that are now uh, approved for use. Or in case of immune-mediated disorders, steroids, plasma pheresis, immunoglobulins, and other steroids bearing agents can be used. Irrespective of the cause, patient has to be given symptomatic management for pain. And rehab measures such as physiotherapy, orthotic, and other assistive devices need to be advised in all patients in order to prevent falls and improve the quality of walking and quality of life. With this, I'll end the uh, class. These are the list of suggested references that I think will be useful in um, revising the, the length dependent polyneuropathies. Thank you. Super. I think in such a short time, Madhu, you managed to cover so much. I think you given everything that they would uh, need, both for the question as well as, you know, uh, preparing to present a case. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was very useful. I thank Dr. Madhu. Uh, let's uh, take our second lecture, which is on calpenopathy by Dr. Vikram uh, Aglave. And Vikram is our assistant professor at JJ Hospital. And I request uh, Vikram to begin his talk. Sir, can you see the screen? Yeah, yeah. we can. Yeah. Today's talk uh, is on calpenopathy. So, uh, to begin with, this is a schematic of the sarcomia. Uh, one second. Here you can see the intracellular uh, compartment that is the actin myosin contractile apparatus, and you can see all these supportive structural proteins which link this uh, uh, contractile apparatus to the outside of the cell, that is to the collagen six. And so many proteins and enzymes are involved, and which uh, the deficiency of which leads to progressive muscle fiber necrosis and uh, uh, replacement by fatty tissue, and that is what we call as muscular dystrophy. So initially, the dystrophinopathies and facioscapular muscular dystrophies were identified on the basis of clinical uh, parameters, and the other group was uh, uh, labeled as limb girdle muscular dystrophy broadly. However, they found it was a heterogeneous group, superficially resembling each other. 
they had autosomal inheritance and a limb girdle, uh, limb girdle pattern of weakness. But additionally, they had a lot of differential features amongst themselves and also wide phenotypic variability, even with the same mutation. So initially classified on the basis of clinical characteristics as autosomal dominant or autosomal recessive limb, limb girdle atrophy. This was in the 1950s. And two patterns were observed, that is scapulohumeral, uh, predominantly affecting the upper girdle, or laden mabius phenotype, that is pelvic femoral girdle involved. Over time, however, uh, since a lot of them have been identified, currently they are classified on the basis of specific molecular deficiency and the pattern of inheritance. Why is this important? Because the uh, for the need for uh, development of new therapeutics, as well as uh, because of the wide phenotypic variability, they could not be reliably uh, clinically uh, differentiated from one another. So uh, in 1995, they classified them as LGMD type 1 and type 2, that is autosomal dominant and autosomal recessive. However, in 19, uh, 2018, the European uh, Neuromuscular Center has reclassified them as LGMD D. D stands for dominant, that is autosomal dominant, and LGMD R. And the terminology for A, B, C, D, uh, based on the chronology of identification of the genes, uh, has been changed to 1, 2, 3, 4. So now they are classified as D1, D2, D3, R1, R2, R3 in this way. So this is the new uh, classification. So today's talk is on calpenopathy, that is LGMD 2A or R1. And uh, we are going to cover the following points. Um, I've also given the likely distribution of marks if this were to be asked as a uh, short note. So I've prepared the lecture on the same outline, but I've covered almost every uh, important point. So the classification, uh, since Calpin was the first gene to be uh, identified, one second. Uh, since Calpin was the first gene to be identified, uh, one second. Sorry. Yeah. Um, it was labeled as 2A initially, that is A because it was the first to be identified. Now it has been reclassified as LGMD R1, recessive 1 for autosomal recessive calpenopathy. And the autosomal dominant form of calpenopathy was initially called 1I. Now it has been uh, labeled as D4, dominant 4. Right. So the preferred term uh, nowadays in use will be calpenopathy because it will cover both. So it is overall the most common uh, LGMD worldwide. Uh, in an Indian series, it was found 40% of patients were found to be calpenopathy based on immunoblotting uh, technique. However, some biases were there. So dysferlin uh, probably uh, can also is almost equally common. And age at onset uh, with the autosomal recessive R1 is typically in the first or second decade. That is 75% of patients will be 5 to 20 years of age. However, there is a very broad range from 2 to 49 years. And uh, it, as you can see, they have been divided into early juvenile or late, juvenile adult or late onset. So most of the cases, almost 85% of cases will be less than 30 years at onset. However, the presentation of the patient may be a few years later because the course is mild to moderate. Uh, slight male preponderance have been found. Um, very few cases may have uh, odd early and rapid progression. Wheelchair dependency usually occurs two to three decades later after onset of disease, around 35 years of age. However, women have longer asymptomatic period and a slower progression of disease. Uh, with regards to uh, dominant type of uh, uh, calpenopathy. The onset is later in the third or fourth decade, mean around 35 years, and it's a slowly progressive disease and has a lot of uh, variability in progression. So it may be either asymptomatic or it may be mildly progressive course, or the patient eventually will become wheelchair dependent, but the age of uh, dependency will be around 60 years as against the recessive period. So what is the pathophysiology? So you should know the functions of the calpin. Uh, calpin 3 molecule. So it is basically not a structural protein. It's an enzyme and it is mu muscle specific. So muscle specific calcium dependent protease. It is involved in sarcomere assembly and remodeling in predominantly in adults. So whenever a patient exercises or a person exercises, uh, there occurs a sarcomere remodeling, which involves proteolysis uh, followed by, that is protein uh, lysis followed by regeneration of the protein, which results in the sarcomere remodeling. This is a normal process. And in the deficiency of calpain, uh, the remodeling process is not um, uh, done properly and hence the patient's eventual muscle mass will be lesser than what it was pre exercise So that is one mechanism, most important mechanism. It also binds to titin. They propose that tit it by the calpain 3 enzyme is kept in check or the enzymatic activity is kept in check by binding to titin in its resting state. However, and uh, it may have a role in stabilizing the sarcomia.
proposed role is also as a part of the disferlin complex uh, in uh, sarcolemmer repair and it also regulates calcium outflow from the sarcoplasmic so it has got a lot of important functions in the muscle and in primary calpenopathy there will be absent or severely deficient calpen and which will eventually lead to this muscle necrosis dystrophy and replacement fatty tissue and however we should also remember that uh, uh, since calpen is bound to titin and it may be a part of the dysferlin complex in uh, titinopathies like wood myopathy and wood limb girdle muscular dystrophy or in a dysferlinopathy on uh, immunoblotting or in estimation of the calpen there may be a secondary calpen deficiency uh, which may be found right so what are the classic phenotypes of the autosomal recessive calpenopathy there are three phenotypes which have been described the most common is the leden mabius phenotype that is the lower girdle that is pelvic femoral phenotype it can start early or in adult age usually and it has a mild to moderate moderately progressive course whereas the second common phenotype is up phenotype that is a uh, scapulo humeral phenotype it has a later onset and a milder phenotype and it may mimic a fshd look like an fshd right and then in children may be incidentally detected with uh, very very high ck levels and they may or may not progress to uh, clinical phenotype later on Uh, in the indian series rarely observed phenotypes were distal myopathy in 4% then a pseudo metabolic myopathy with exercise into uh, systems were found in a uh, two three patients only and unclassified myopathies in a few patients so with the leden mabius phenotype phenotype early developmental milestones are normal under the dmd then the class is cetric pelvic girdle total girdle uh, periscapular muscle and truncal muscle involvement the form of weakness and wasting uh, in the uh, lower limbs the posterior thigh muscle that is the hip extensors and the knee flexors along with the hip adductors that is the posterior medial compartment of the thigh is much more affected than their antagonist muscles then uh, early so what, this is a comp for lgmds but uh, what are the characteristic features for calpenopathy so one of them is early symmetric scap winging in which the entire medial border juts so it is predominantly due to serratus anterior resting and weakness then early abdominal weakness presenting as an abdominal hernia so external oblique muscle usually or sometimes the rectus abdominis muscle may be weak and lead to abdominal hernia and some of these patients may actually present a surgeon for this hernias then early tendo achilles contracture leading to a habitual to walking so this is one of the characteristic features of calpenopathy early to walkers so later on uh, this contract also involves the hip knees elbow fingers but in late stages and spinal deformities in the form of scoliosis because of trunk and muscle involvement it, uh, it can occur but in late stages facial neck cardiac and respiratory muscles are spared and this will differentiate from the other dystrophinopathies and limb girdle muscular dystrophies no macroglossy or intellectual disability is seen in the late stage primarily the patient will be wheelchair bound and there will be a loss of ambulation and uh, eventual contractures will develop however a minority of patients may go on to develop respiratory insufficiency from the severe scoliosis causing restriction as well as some uh, diaphragmatic uh, insufficiency may also occur the up phenotype needs a special uh, uh, differential from fshd but the points against up will be there will be facial weakness even if it is not symptomatic there will be mild facial weakness in fshd then a, a scapular winging in fshd is typically asymmetric and uh, inferior medial border uh, is one which juts not the entire medial border and beaver sign uh, may be positive in fshd Uh, the dominant uh, calpenopathy D4 will usually have a similar pattern of involvement that is the pelvic girdle followed by shoulder girdle and truncal muscles but much milder disease or they may even be asymptomatic however a prominent feature found in more than 50% of these patients is back pain and myalgias so uh, when do you suspect calpenopathy whenever there is a limb girdle pattern of progressive muscle weakness the patient is usually able to walk he has developed his gait and is able to walk normally and then uh, uh, eventually presents with a limb girdle pattern of weakness there is no calf atrophy or hypertrophy there is early toe walking due to tendo achilles contractures then early symmetric scapula winking abdominal muscle laxity with herniation and scoliosis with other spinal deformities these are the characteristic features when you should clinically suspect calpenopathy so i have got some images here you can see the ankle contractures in this ball um, in the second image shows a symmetric medial uh, border jutting uh, showing such a such of a serratus type of winging 
then this is one of my patients with a very prominent bilateral symmetric scapular winging. Then this patient had scapular winging and along with the abdominal hernia due to external oblique muscle weakness. Then these are two of my patients, the first one and his uncle in the second image. So you can see the uh, paraspinal muscle vesting as well as some scoliosis is there, symmetric winging of the scapula, entire middle border of the scapula is jutting and uh, obviously you can see these herniations of the abdomen. So uh, the indications and diagnosis. Uh, so there is a, uh, we should remember in the diagnosis of limb girdle muscular dystrophy, there is a paradigm shift. Earlier we used to go in orderly manner, like we used to do history examination, the CPK levels, then the electrodiagnostics, then muscle imaging or biopsy was done, and then genetic testing was done because single gen testing was there and it was not cost effective to test many genes. However, with the advent of NGS uh, the, and the resultant increase, uh, diagnostic yield, genetic testing should be preferred over this ancillary test. The role of ancillary test is to clarify under undiagnosed cases or inconclusive cases and whenever you get a variant of undetermined significance. So in Calpin, we already know more than 490 mutations. However, one second. Uh, more than 490 mutations are seen in calpenopathy and uh, however still new uh, mutations may be identified in these cases you may need to proceed for a muscle biopsy so what are the investigations we'll just go through first is creatine kinase serum uh, levels. so they are elevated since infancy at the onset of the disease at the time of presentation the levels may be very high but they may become normal in late stage the mean levels are around 2,000 to 6,000. However, they are less than that found in dysferlin. Dysferlin, the mean levels are much more than 5,000. And uh, electromyography will show typical myopathic changes like small amplitude polyphasic potentials. However, it may be normal in the presymptomatic stage. So muscle imaging. So um, it, the main role of muscle imaging is to differentiate this uh, limb girdle muscular dystrophy from uh, dystrophinopathies, SMAs, other causes of proximal limb girdle weakness, uh, inflammatory myopathies. It will not be uh, very diagnostic for a proper calpain versus dysferlin because many uh, much overlap is seen. Um, then early and preferential fatty replacement, the uh, sequence of involvement is uh, first the medial gastrocnemius, then the posterior compartment of thigh and the hip adductors, which are clinically much more affected. And there is a variable involvement of the quadriceps and there is sparing of sartorius and gracilis. In the autosomal dominant variant, they have found um, paraspinal muscles are completely lost and replaced by so the predominant truncal vesting is seen along with the uh, hip extensors, and it is replaced by fat. Imaging can also be useful to identify the site for biopsy. However, like I've said, genetic tests are the investigation of choice as of now. So, um, yeah, whenever you see a patient with a genetic um, myopathy, then the diagnostic test of choice will be a multi-gene panel. So this is the first test that we should consider, uh, a clinical exome study, which will test uh, even the calpin gene as well as other genes which can present in a similar way. Comprehensive genomic testing like whole exome and whole genome sequencing, it has a slightly higher diagnostic yield, but it is not cost effective. Single gene testing can be considered when calpinopathy seems to be a very likely diagnosis, like very characteristic presentation with all the typical features. Uh, that may be cost effective in this case. However, targeted analysis of specific mutations can be performed, especially for carrier testing and in certain backgrounds in which there is a founder mutations. Like the, in India, the Agarwal community has been found to have a founder mutation and uh, that same mutation can be tested. It will be very cost effective. So these are the diagnostic test of choice. For well, muscle biopsy is typically reserved when the genetic studies are inconclusive or we get a variant of undetermined significance or when it is not available. So uh, mild non-specific myopathic changes will be seen like internalization of nuclei, split fibers, lobulated fibers, which are particularly common in calpenopathy, type 1 fiber predominance, and the muscle atrophy will correlate with the stage of disease. Typical active dystrophic changes will also be seen like fiber size variability, fibrosis, necrosis, uh, fiber basophilia, that is regenerating and degenerating fibers. However, it has been observed lesser regeneration occurs in calpin compared to other LGMDs because it's a repair enzyme. Eosinophilic infiltrates may occur in up to 10 to 20% of cases as an early and transient feature, which may confuse with the inflammatory myopathy. So that this has to be remembered. 
LGMD D4, our dominant uh, variant Calpin, we get only mild non-specific myopathic changes. So biopsy, uh, you have to proceed for specialized study to diagnose calpinopathy. So immunohistochemistry is not possible as anti-calpin antibodies for this immunohistochemistry are not yet available. However, immunoblot analysis is very helpful in certain situations. It is highly specific when the calpin is very uh, severely reduced or it is absent. And the correlation with genetic studies is uh, biallelic mutations can be detected in up to 85% of patients who have severe or absent calpin in the uh, immunoblot. However, it lacks specificity because uh, there are secondary reductions with dysperlin and titan that we have already discussed. And also artificial degradation of calpen 3 can occur in the muscle biopsy. It, it also lacks sensitive because calpen 3 may be normal in amount, but it may be functional inactive in also up to 30% of cases. So it won't be a definitive diagnosis. Hence, genetic testing is the preferred uh, test and proceed to muscle biopsy immunoblot only if um, uh, it is inconclusive. So differential diagnosis of calpin will be other limb girdle muscular dystrophies, dystrophinopathies, uh, FSHD in the herb phenotype, uh, then contracture myopathies like uh, emeritrophis and collagenopathies. Uh, sometimes exercise-induced symptoms can be seen, so metabolic myopathies and SMA. Treatment, uh, initially upon diagnosis, uh, we should do a baseline a grading of the muscle strength and functional capacity. Orthopedic evaluation should be done for contractures. Evaluation for uh, any orthosis, when especially when the walking is already compromised. Uh, baseline cardiopulmonary evaluation and genetic counseling should be offered. There are uh, treatment guidelines, uh, general treatment guidelines provided by the American Academy of Neurology in 2014. So passive physical therapy and stretching exercise, it will prolong the time a patient can walk by preventing, uh, maintaining the joint flexibility, preventing contractures. And it has been proposed to so, back aerobic exercise like swimming and stationary bicycling with supervised submaximal. This is important. Submaximal effort should be done. If it is a maximal effort, then the repair of the muscle won't occur and the patient may actually worsen. So supervised uh, aerobic exercises. This will improve the muscle efficiency as well as lessen the fatigue of the patient. Then technical aids can be offered whenever uh, the patient's walking is compromised like canes, walkers, wheelchairs. Very important point is knee, ankle, foot orthosis at night just like in DMDs. So um, this will prevent at the, in the bedtime, if this orthosis is applied, the patient's contracture development will be delayed. Surgical correction whenever there are deformities and contractures. In the late stage of disease, some patients may develop respiratory impairment, insufficiency, and uh, in this case, the respiratory air prolonged survival. So you should monitor for signs of nocturnal hypoxemia like daytime sleepiness, then pulse oximetry can be done, and they can be offered NIV or BiPAP. Then influence the vaccination should be done annually. Social and emotional support should be provided and also annual surveillance of the uh, patient's clinical condition should be done. What should be avoided in, uh, in particular in any limb girdle muscular and particularly in calpin and dysphony? That is strenuous exercise should be avoided. Body weight gain should be avoided. Prolonged immobility, physical trauma, which will lead to immobilization. Uh, this should be avoided. It will accelerate the contractions. Then uh, as far as possible, uh, halogenated anesthetic, succinylcholine, and statins should be avoided as they may worsen the muscle disease and the theoretical risk of malignant hypothermia. In pregnancy, uh, it has been shown most pregnancies are uncomplicated. However, in wheelchair-bound pregnant patients, there may be abnormal fetal presentations. And in such cases, epidural anesthesia may also be difficult because of the scoliosis. Uh, additionally, half of patients report deterioration of symptoms of limb girdle dystrophy during pregnancy in any limb girdle muscular dystrophy. Genetic counseling should be offered to the family members. Carrier testing can be done with specific pathogenic mutation testing. Premarital counseling of carriers as well as patients and prenatal testing uh, can prenatal testing is also available at present. Uh, what are the therapies under investigation? So um, no specific therapy has been approved or in clinical human clinical trials as of yet, but the a avian um, adenovirus associated vector mediated uh, gene transfer, that is gene therapy, uh, it has shown prompt results in experimental models. Uh, the initial um, trials had shown cardiotoxicity, so new trials are undergoing, but it had shown very promising results. Then mesenchymal stem cell therapy, which will express the calpen 3 uh, that is also under investigation in trials. Uh, 
Then there's this coalition to cure Calpain 3, that is C3, uh, which is a US best uh, patient foundation, and it is dedicated to uh, for this calpanopathy patients for the treatment and future uh, treatment development. So my references will be a uh, article in December 2019, which mentions the uh, classi revised classification is given. And this uh, beautiful article by Angelini, it's a updated article. So every time it gets updated and few other, this Partha Ketal had the Indian study of Calpenopathy in 2010 and Kadilkas's textbook, Neuromuscular Disorders. Thank you. Thank you, Vikram. That was very thorough. Thank you for an extensive review on Calpenopathy. Let's uh, do our third lecture, which is the role of muscle enzyme Histochemistry in Diagnosis of Muscle Disorders by Dr. Nandish, uh, who is an associate professor at NIMHANS. I request Dr. Nandish to do yes. his talk. Thank you, sir. Uh, I would like to thank uh, the organizing team of FINE for giving me an opportunity to be part of this great program and uh, straight away go to the first slide. Nandish, uh, can you be a bit louder? Uh, slightly the voices. Is it? Yeah, one second. Okay. Ah, any improvement now? Yeah, I think you are audible. Yeah, that's fine. That's good. Okay, is the screen visible, sir? Yes. Yeah, that's good. So. We'll start with uh, our lecture. This is how I have divided the lecture. It's basically very basic. I'll be taking you to a very basic information and uh, basically from the laboratory side of uh, working up for any suspected case of neuromuscular disease. As you all know, muscle biopsy is an essential component. Please, it has got some role in the workup for patients with neuromuscular disorders. And what happens is uh, most of the routine stents which we use for general pathology and general neurosurgical biopsy will not be applicable to muscle biopsy workup. The reason is many of the diagnoses which you consider do not show any significant changes on routine staining. Like for example, if you take up mitochondrial myopathy, metabolic, some of the congenital myopathies, if you take up congenital myopathies, the subdivisions of congenital myopathies are based on a certain uh, laboratory observation itself, means histological observation itself. But however, except for central nuclear myopathy, None of the other congenital myopathies you can diagnose on routine staining, even remaining rod. Sorry for the spelling mistake. And even neurogenic change, of course, as long as there is atrophy, no problem. Once there is no atrophy, only grouping, you will not be able to appreciate any kind of neurogenic changes on routine stain. So EHC is a useful supplement and to the routine light microscopy workup, especially with regard to fiber type recognition, fiber typing, detecting any alteration in the muscle fibers, and for many more features, which I will discuss. Overall, if you take up, it's a very complementary tool to the conventional histological workup. It complements immunohistochemistry chemistry and molecular pathology because it helps in recognizing which particular category of disease which we have to work up. And a, a broad category which you would have considered a differential diagnosis will be further shortlisted on routine, on routine and electronic, uh, uh, sorry, and enzyme chemistry, and then only we'll go for additional testing. So overall, I would like to say that it has a very significant role in the pathohistological diagnosis, and thus it helps in strengthening your diagnostic workup. Now, going to the very basic, what is the principle of this enzyme history chemistry? The entire principle is in the name itself, and the father of this enzyme history chemistry is this AGPPS. He didn't uh, work on muscle itself. It was on multiple, uh, multiple tissues, and muscle was one of the tissue on which he worked. So we'll just divide this entire name into further, that is histochemistry. As the name suggests, histo means tissue or cells, chemistry is the chemical reaction. So whenever you do a chemical reaction, any kind of staining is a kind of chemical reaction where the chemical goes and reacts with, with two different uh, subcomponents of itself. It could be nucleus, it could be cytoplasm, cytoplasmic protein, all those things. So any chemical reaction which helps to localize a substance within the tissue is referred to as histochemistry. And when you add an enzyme into this chemical reaction, you call it as enzyme histochemistry. So it's basically combines enzymatic reaction with histochemistry. So it's like a link between biochemistry and morphology, pathology and biochemistry. That's what it is doing. Basically to recognize the topographical distribution of some of these reactive material, basically the enzyme. 
So it helps in it basically the principle is based on the activity of enzymes recognition in certain tissues. And the end result is some kind of color change, which helps in visualization where this enzyme is located and alteration in the enzyme. So basically, we depend on the end result of color dye reaction and where it is located, how intense it is, and the distribution of it, which gives an indirect evidence of the histotopographic enzyme localization. So in short, if you want to define the principle of enzy enzymistic chemistry, it would be called as a morphological technique that is applied to give functional answers or, uh, functional answers to the functional questions in histopathology. That means to say you are giving in functional uh, answers to some of the morphological changes which you would have seen. Now, why do you need EHC? Go going to the basic and to answer, it just helps in the assessment of internal structure. You would say the best internal structure means ultrastructure. No, it's not ultra ultrastructure. It gives an indirect evidence of the distribution of various components within the sarcoplasm. The most important would be recognizing the fiber type that is slow type 1 and type 2. You know that type 2 can be further subdivided and in various diseases, one of the particular subtype would be increased all. That is the one. Second thing is, you know that enzymes, metabolism is actually mediated by enzymes. So indirectly gives a, a metabolic status of a particular, uh, particular cell that is the muscle here. And enzyme activity, enzyme activity gets altered depending on uh, various conditions that also that information also will be getting. So, and some of the metabolic disorders are due to enzyme deficiency that also can be picked up using enzyme chemistry, like Macar's disease that is uh, glycogen storage is type 5, where myophosphorylase is deficient, phosphofructokinase deficiency, all these things you can do enzyme chemistry and pick up, pick up at the tissue level. And also indirectly gives an evidence of protein, whether it is deficient, whether it is ag aggregating or whether it's abnormally uh, accumulating, all those information can be uh, seeked or searched for through enzyme chemistry. Now, there are certain prerequisites which you should know. That means to say we always depend for this enzyme chemistry. We cannot do on the routine fixation. We, have, we depend on fresh muscle. That means to say a muscle which is not exposed to formalin vapors or formalin uh, fluid fixating. Because enzymes are inactivated by formalin. You know that formalin is a denaturing agent. It, it, it denatures the protein, coagulates the protein. So you need fro uh, fresh tissue and that has to be frozen. And this freezing is not like other intraoperative site, uh, intraoperative tissues, which can be received and directly kept it in the freezing compartment. It's not like that. You have to freeze it in a very, very uh, sudden way into a viscous state. Viscous state means you, know, you don't do, do the freezing very gradually. It is suddenly dropped down from room temperature to minus 160 degrees centigrade. This is called as bringing down to viscous temperature. It's called, also called as snap freezing or flash freezing. If you have any doubt, I can mention to you just that word of snap freezing should be enough. What, that is, what does that mean? Basically, you take liquid nitrogen, which is minus 160 degrees centigrade. You cannot place the tissue directly in the liquid nitrogen. So you use a, a protectant called as isopentane. So isopentane, which is cooled in liquid nitrogen, that is minus 160 degrees. In that isopentane, you will place this muscle tissue and that will suddenly come down from a room temperature or whatever, uh, 30 degrees it is or 25 degrees, whatever, from there it goes directly to minus 140, minus 160. That is called as snap freezing. After that, what we do is we take cryosectioning. In a sense, from this frozen tissue, snap frozen tissue, we take it into a specialized machine, microto machine, which is, which is running at a temperature of minus 20 degrees centigrade, minus 20 to minus 30 degrees centigrade. They will cut the sections at a thickness of 10 microns. So cryo sections are taken at minus 20 degrees centigrade and this muscle is oriented in such a way that we will see only the transverse section, transverse cut section of the muscle fibers and not, not the longitudinal section because many fibers, many features can be appreciated on transverse sections. So these are the prerequisites, essential prerequisites. That's the reason why you need to have a little infrastructure and also uh, the method of transporting and storage. Again. Other things which generally you will know that any kind of uh, laboratory test means you need general consumables, but in this regard, a lot of pH monitoring is required, so a lot of buffers are needed, and these buffers have to be pre freshly prepared, not old, because the pH deteriorates with storage. So the greatest, greatest challenge will be the transportation and storage, because delay, tra delay in transportation will weaken the enzymes, will break down the enzymes, so you'll not be able to pick up. So these are the prerequisites for, a, for any general thing. I'm not going into details of it, because that will not be generated from your perspective, it's mainly from the lab perspective. So going further, what are the types of enzyme chemistry which is needed? In this regard, broadly, we classify it as non-enzyme stains, which includes the routine stains, HND. But however, there is one non-enzyme stain called as modified gomeris trichrome, 
which though it is non-enzyme chain, it is taken as an enzyme hysteric chemistry because it's somewhat related to enzyme hysteric chemistry. That is the only non-enzyme chain which is considered under the category of enzyme hysteric chemistry. Otherwise, the enzyme chains include two important, three important oxidative enzyme chains. The first two are succinic dehydrogenase and nicotinamide adenine dinucleated uh, hydrogenase, okay, phosphate hydrogenase. The other thing is cytochrome oxidase, which can be done alone or in combination with STH. I will tell you the reason why it has to be done in combination. Then is a, a reducing enzyme referred to as menadion linked alpha glycerophosphate. Then ATPs at three pages, at least two pages, it has to be done to see the reversal of staining. And then acid phosphatase, myophosphatase, and phosphofructokinase. The list continues. But the ones which I have highlighted in dark, that is one, the one, the four or five which I have highlighted in bold, those are most important, which we routinely use. All other things are dependent on the diagnosis, which we consider based on the parameters which would have, which we would have evaluated. So I, I mentioned it to you. There is one exception to the list that is modified gomeris trichome is included under enzyme stain because it has some enzyme properties, it has some similarity uh, in the reaction, color reaction. That is the reason why. Now application utility. Now a series of images I will be showing. That's the reason why to go uh, further, just look at this. This is a routine amatoxin usin. It looks totally normal and so many changes can be picked up on, on enzyme chemistry. Okay, this is just to give a comparison. Now we'll go to that list. The first one, a most important uh, enzyme chemistry, though it's not an enzyme, but still it is a allied enzyme chemistry is modified gomeris trichrome. A very useful uh, stain, which is done, which has to be done to pick up nimaline rods. Otherwise on routine staining, you cannot pick up. So this helps in the picking up the nimaline rods and to recognize the congenital myopathy. And most importantly, the ragged red fibers, which is one of the important finding, histological finding for mitochondrial myopathies. Then rim vacuoles. You know that there are many conditions of neuromuscular myopathies, which will have vacuoles. And thus, these vacuoles would have accumulated many degenerated proteins. And these proteins would be many times amyloid, which, which will have amyloid properties in its reaction. So many of them will have amyloid, but you don't know which exactly the protein involved in this. However, these amyloid properties will may not be very conspicuous. However, on this routine MGT stain, on this routine MGT stain, we, we can pick up the rim vacuum. The most important under this, you know, that inclusion body myositis, then is that distal myopathies. The one most important is the GNE myopathy. Myofibrillar myopathies, all, sorry for the spelling mistake, and the OPMDs. These are some of the important ones, but rare ones are also there which can show rim vacuum. So these are the images. This is a normal MGT, which will give a green reaction. And, and mitochondria will show, will appear as small, fine red granules under normal staining. But you can see the rimmed vacuoles on the right side over here. You can see the nimaline rods, which may be a subsarcolemal ML or in the center, okay, or within that, and rimmed vacuoles. These are the four important, three or four important utilities of modified gomeris trichrome, right? Now, going further, the next is the big list of enzyme list. And this is a list which I already mentioned to you. I will take up individual and explain it to you, okay? First one, we take up succinic dehydrogenase. This is a very useful and oxidative enzyme stain. And this is an enzyme which is present in mitochondria. Actually, it represents complex two. Okay, so the five complexes in that the complex two is mainly succinic dehydrogenase. So any deficiency or abnormality in this enzyme would indicate mitochondrial disorder. And the localization could be intermyofibrillar. So it I, actually the localization also will indicate. So any abnormality in that, many uh, if there is increase in that intermyofibrillar accumulation can start. And uh, indirectly it will indicate the distribution in the network of sarcoplasmic reticulum. So early changes in that can also be picked up, picked up based on this STH. That means you don't have to go to ultrastructural level. Vaguely, it can indicate the indirect, it is an indirect strain for recognizing the myofibular network and the sarcoplasmic uh, network. Because change in the myofibular network will change the sarcoplasmic reticulum network. So it will indicate that there is something happening at a sarcoplasm level, at a cytoskeleton level, at an enzyme concentration level, and at a, uh, at a ultrastructural level. And one thing you should remember, tubular aggregate. This part I will come to you uh, very soon. For the time being, you should remember that succinic dehydrogenase will not stain tubular aggregates, okay? T-tubules does not, does not contain succinic dehydrogenase. It's a very important clue to differentiate between that. Because tubular aggregates will also appear as ragged red fibers or red granules, which will mimic ragged red granules, tubular aggregates. So MGT will stain tubular aggregates. NADH will also, uh, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, uh, NADH will also stain the tubular aggregates. So, in mitochondria, you will see that MGT is stained, uh, uh, NADH is stained. And in the same way, tubular aggregates also will stain in MGT, 
will also stain in NADH and it will be the SDH which will actually differentiate between tubular aggregates and mitochondrial myopathies. That's the reason why I have specified this, you should remember. So, this combination of enzyme frequency will help you in differentiating many of the closely mimickers both histologically and clinically. And that's the reason why the specificity is much better than NADH. So, we depend on succeeding RNAs. So, you have two oxidative enzyme strains in this. And target fibers, what do you mean by this target fibers? Target fibers are those where you will have a central pale area surrounded by a rim of darkening. This happens in neurogenic process. When, the, uh, when, the, when there is an endurogenic atrophy or a neurogenic process, a de a denervation, this muscle fiber shrinks. As it is shrinking, there is some kind of realignment of the myofibrils and these enzymes will all go, uh, will rearrange in such a way that there is a central area of I put, I, I mean, a non stained area with the rim of hyperstain, which I will show you the photograph. Okay. And next is in myopathy, sometimes it will look normal on HND. But there will be on oxidative enzyme strain some kind of unstained area, such as a lobule or a moth eaten, like something eaten away. So that is also a clue of myopathy and it is usually indicated degenerative changes that is dystrophy. I will show you the photographs like this. Uh, together I will show you because NADH and STH will have somewhat similar features. All are similar except that NADH is more richer. That's why it will be darkly stained. It, it's not only in intermyofibular area, it is in the perinuclear subsarcolemer and it is not only in mitochondria, it will be present even on T tubules. And it represents complex one of mitochondria, so it, you can pick up, it, there will be abnormality in, in mitochondrial disorders. There will be abnormality in the staining of NADH. And again, this since it is located in the uh, sarcoplasmic reticulum, it will give the details of that, and it can pick up early structural abnormality in the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Network. And most importantly, you can pick up tubular aggregates, which can be stained even on MGT, but not in STH. Since, because this is present is staining tubular aggregates also, the specificity comes down as compared to uh, SDH in relation to mitochondrial disorder. Target fibers, again, I told you, in neurogenic status, uh, neurogenic process, you will have a central area of hypo, hypo stained area brimmed by a dark area, which I'll show you that, and moth eaten and lobulated fibers, which you will see as a sign of degeneration in myopathy and dystrophy. So these are the images, as you can see here, moth eaten fibers, I told you, these are signs of uh, uh, degenerative myopathic disorder like dystrophy. On routine stain, you can you will miss it easily. But here you can show that multiple areas of myofibular degeneration would have started. And this is the target which I mentioned to you in the neurogenic process, a central unstained area, a rim of dark zone, target like a target. And this is a very important clue. This is referred as core. One of the uh, subtype of congenital myopathy that is core central core disease. You can pick up on this, even multi mini core disease also you can pick up. Without oxidative enzyme stain, you cannot pick up core disease because the definition of core is central area of non oxidative stain. Okay, and this is re referred to as ragged blue fiber. The way you saw ragged red fiber on mo modified Gomeris trichrome, in mitochondrial mapathies, you will see ragged blue fiber as a, as, a, as a similar to that. Okay, ragged blue fiber on both STH and NADH, you will see. And most importantly, NADH will stain uh, in will stain target uh, sorry uh, tubular aggregates which look like ragged blue fiber, but SDH will not stain tubular aggregates. That is very important to differentiate between these two. Otherwise, tubular aggregates will mimic mitochondrial myopathy very much. Now, going to the next oxidative enzyme stain, that is the cytochrome oxidase, which is also present in which is also an enzyme complex in mitochondria that represents complex four. It's also very specific, and the localization is same, similar to SDH, and the specificity is quite good because it doesn't stain. Uh, other areas, other components that is like tubular aggregates and all those things. Cox deficiency you will see in mitochondrial myopathies and mitochondrial disorders. And this is how you, uh, my, uh, Cox deficiency will look like. If you stain, use only the Cox enzyme, what happens is many times pale area, you don't know whether it is staining uh, artifact or what. So to pick up Cox deficiency, you combine this with SDH. Okay. So wherever Cox deficient areas are there, SDH will be retained. So you can take this combination of Cox SDH will be very useful combination which will help in PKM Cox deficiency much better as compared to using Cox alone enzyme. Okay, now going further to ATPase, the main enzymes we have covered, all others are very few, uh, a very less specific or what you call less utility enzymes, and only in specific situations you will be using it. The most important among the other group would be the ATPase, adenosine triphosphatase, and this uh, you have to do at least in two, two combinations to see the reversal of enzyme stains. Okay, I will tell you the reason why. So two important pre-incubation pH are important. That is one acidic, that is 4.6. Another one is basic 9.4. You can use additional component of 4.3 to be more sure. This may need to differentiate between type 1 and type 2 fibers. Type 1 and type 2 fibers, you can differentiate based on oxidative enzymes also. That is type 1 will be more oxidative rich, type 2 will be less. But they're not that specific because the darkness will may vary depending on the incubation and the strength of the substrate. 
But in this situation, what happens is the differentiation and the color reaction is much more clear, much more definite. You can not only differentiate type 1 and type 2, even you can go further dividing into two, type 2A, 2B, 2C. 2A is, 2B is considered to be more intermediate, 2C is much more immature, something like regenerative fiber. Okay, you can pick up all these things under ATP is better. So it helps in recognizing which particular subtype is predominant, which particular subtype is involved, which particular subtype is heterotrophic, hypertrophic, all kind of changes you can appreciate based on that. So if you take an acidic pH stain, type 1 fibers are dark. The opposite is 9.4, where the type 2 fibers will be dark and type uh, 1 fiber will be pale. That means to say all acidic pH, please remember this, all acidic pH, you will have type 1 fibers dark. All uh, base, uh, basic uh, pH, you will have type 2 fibers being dark. So in, if you take up among type 2 subtypes, type 2A will be the one which will show typical type 2 features. But type 2 will be the intermediate one. Type 2C is immature, something in between pale and intermediate, so type 2A and 2B, something like that, immature. Okay. So you can take it in that way. Otherwise, if broadly, if you can divide, that is fine. So this is how you will see. Suppose if you take 4.6, type 1 fiber is, will be dark. Actually, sorry about the uh, some mistake is happening in the test. So 4.6 type 1 will be dark. The arrow has gone away uh, much further. So this is, you can see. See, 4.6 type 1 will be dark. Type 2A will be very pale. Type 2B will be intermediate. This is 9.4. Uh, forget about the left uh, image because there is some arrow differences. If you take up here, uh, 9.4 type 2 will be dark. Type 1 will be pale. And grouping. This is how you recognize grouping. See, on HND, if you see this particular right side image, it will look normal. But this is actually a denervation denervation pattern where there will be grouping. So grouping can be easily picked up on ATP is very important for picking up neurogenic changes. So la last uh, couple of slides, some of the rare strains which we use on specific situation is myophosphorylase, which will also help in distinguishing type 1 and type 2, but it is a very, very delicate stain, which will fade very easily. So that's the reason why we don't depend on that. Only when we suspect Macker's disease, glycogen disease type 5, only then we do. See here, you can make out normal control and and it will be deficient in all the situations you should always run normal control because you don't know the laboratory standards the technique we don't know so you have to always run a control similarly you can do a, a phosphofructose uh, kinase uh, staining also which is also laborious little to pick up specific deficiency of that so another situation is lysosomal steroid disease whether you're suspecting a mucopolysaccharide disease or whether you're suspecting acid mass ma acid maltase any lysosomal steroid disease this acid phosphorylase will be elevated because they are present in the lysosomes of macrophages so acid phosphorylase is an indirect area, a, a clue for many lysosomal storage disorders. That is one thing. And yeah, additional information before I end is, let's take up uh, this, okay. Is, ah, now you, one more thing which I have not covered in so far is this one and just last one or two slides, that's all. In myotubular myopathy, you know that it's a type of congenital myopathy, okay, X-linked. Here, you can pick up, even if you have not done any genetic or any, you have not done any other stain, you can just suspect this because of this. This is a unique oxidative enzyme stain. You can see that central area is dark, peripherally it is pale. This is an indirect evidence of myotubular myopathy. And then if you do an AT phase, it's opposite. The central area will be pale, unstained, peripheral area will be dark. This is an entire clue of myotubular myopathy, where you will see a central nuclear with a halo around. As similar to that, the autosomal variant would be the central nuclear myopathy, where you will see centralized nuclei in more than 30% of the muscle fibers. You know that normally the nuclei is below the sarcolemma and only in 2% of the fibers you may see centralized nuclei. But in central nuclear myopathy, more than 30% of the fibers will have the central nuclei. And apart from that, you can see that in central nuclear myopathy, in an oxidative enzyme strains, there will be radiating kind of zones, lines, linear strands like structures will be there. This is a very important clue that if that is present, it indicates that a particular mutation also called referred as dynamic mutation. This is one of our case. You can see that this is from uh, some other source. And this is the one you can see a radiating spokes, I think, which indicates a particular mutation also. That is the one. And lastly, course, as I mentioned to you, you cannot diagnose central core disease. Of course, genetically you can uh, diagnose, but histologically, if you have to diagnose, you have to do an oxidative enzyme as you can see at core. This core will run all along the muscle fiber, unlike target, which will have a zone of darkly staining it and another important thing is you can you can further go to uh, further subtype the core using atpase where you will see whether atpase is retained or disorganized based on the my myofibular network being disorganized now another variant of central core disease is the multi mini core which also can be picked up only on oxidative enzyme stain where you will see multiple fine cores which may be conglomerate or which may be very punctate like this again you need uh, oxidative enzyme stain for that 
and another uh, subtype of congenital myopathy that is congenital fiber type disproportion that you can diagnose only on these uh, enzyme history chemistry which will pick up the different types of fibers especially most important will be the atps because that will help in picking up type 1 fibers which are hypoplastic which are smaller than 25% of their usual uh, number and the density also will be more okay type 1 fiber hypoplasia and predominance that's what happens they are smaller the size is much much smaller almost 3 4 of it okay lastly myofibular myopathy so many of the uh, these will present will have so much overlapping features with dystrophy and other even neurogenic also it will overlap so many differential diagnoses will be there on clinical examination on routine stain which will be very difficult on these enzyme stains you can pick up that there are certain vacuoles here and these vacuoles will not be oxidative in, in nature when you do an oxidative enzyme stain they will be unstained as you can see in these two images some of them may look like core but they are not core so in those situations you can do a re reduction opposite of oxidative enzyme you can use a reducing enzyme referred to as menodian linked alpha glycerophosphate so that will pick up these reducing bodies and most of them these are excuse me, these uh, reflect a kind of abnormal protein accumulation which will have amyloid -like, amyloid like features so this is an indirect evidence you can go further in the genetic workup so these are the overall utility of uh, uh, the enzyme history chemistry so i'd like to conclude by mentioning these things these uh, important statements that take home, take home messages that enzyme history chemistry is a useful diagnostic workup tool in any muscle biopsy interpretation that means to say without enzyme history chemistry a muscle biopsy report is absolutely uh, incomplete and it actually gives a functional information it's a functional indirect uh, technique it's a technique which gives an indirect evidence of the function of the enzyme that is, through this it will provide insight into the pathology mechanism and the pathophysiology of it and also since it, these are enzymes it gives a metabolic information also at a very early level you can detect even many, many of the metabolic myopathies storage disorders can be picked up and thus it constitutes a very valuable complement to all other special techniques which as pathologists we do that is immunosequencing and molecular pathology and thus indirectly supplements your clinical decision in diagnosis and management uh, there are no references because these are all small small things which has been taken from multiple textbooks and uh, from our own experience and images so there are no references if you have any any particular book you need i can we can always provide that absolutely very thorough again dr nandish thank you very much it was a very useful lecture let's uh, Move on to our last lecture for the day by Saraswati, which is on uh, myositis-specific antibodies, another among the workup, and I uh, request her to begin a lecture. Thank you, sir, for this opportunity. Uh, I'll be talking on myositis-specific antibodies. So traditionally, we know the idiopathic inflammatory myositis. were classified as dermatomyositis antisynthetase syndromes immune mediated necrotizing myositis inclusion body myositis and we know there is a doubt of whether polymyositis still exists however we are now evolving we have moved to auto antibodies among all these diseases what i mentioned sub types that i mentioned now we will uh, read the we will go through the auto antibodies so they are classified as myositis specific and myositis associated so myositis specific is when they have a specificity for the particular group of these uh, just now classification what i showed and the myositis associated auto antibodies can be found in any of these and they may also be found in other systemic autoimmune rheumatic diseases so coming to the auto antibodies i'll just list them before i go through so we have uh, anti amino acyl trna synthetases the anti ars antibodies they are anti jo1 which is the most common then we have certain others like pl12 7 ej oj ks etc then we these are among the anti synthetase syndromes and then we have among the dermatomyositis group uh, the anti mi2 then nxp2 mda5 tif1 gamma and among the immune mediated necrotizing group what i just showed here in this we have anti srp and anti hmg uh, anti hmg cr the myositis and of course there's a blank line for many new antibodies which will come up now i think and uh, myositis associated antibodies like i said they are anti ro 52 60 la anti pmscl and the un rnp which can be found in other systemic autoimmune rheumatic diseases so this is the difference between the myositis specific and myositis associated so uh, the the association with myopathy is common in both however in among among these groups uh, 
MAA can be found among these groups. Both are found, but they're also found in other diseases like other systemic autoimmune rheumatic diseases. And the prevalence in general population for MSA is almost none. While for MAA, it uh, it can be found in about 0.1 percent of the population or so. So I told you about the autoantibodies. These are the target autoantigens of these autoantibodies. So they, the amino acid tRNA synthetases target the incorporation of the amino acids into proteins while MI2 and all, they're all involved in transcriptional regulation basically. So I just told the first subgroup that is dermatomyositis. We all know the classical skin manifestations, the muscle weakness, and they can have arthritis. Some small people can have, small amount of uh, population can have ILD malignancy. Now we see the antibodies in this condition, that is anti-MI2, NXP2, TIF1, gamma, SAE, MDFI. Most of these anti uh, autoantibodies, uh, they are quite specific to this group and they're almost mutually exclusive. So if MI2 is seen, usually we don't see NXP2 in that group of uh, subjects. And also when they, we have uh, uh, MI, when we have dermatomyositis as a group, almost 70% have these autoantibodies, any of these, about 30% may still be autoantibody negative. So if I have to list another subgroup of dermatomyositis, the next group here will be autoantibody negative dermatomyositis, which constitutes still about 30% of the patients. So I will just briefly go through the autoantibodies. Uh, MI2, we know it has acute onset, relatively mild disease. It is a classical dermatomyositis. It involves muscle, it involves skin. There's a good therapeutic response. The risk of malignancy is less. So these are the main points which you have to focus while either diagnosing clinically or when you're preparing a answer for the question. And anti-NXP2, they also have severe muscle disease. They have dysphagia, subcutaneous edema, severe skin changes, increased risk of calcinosis. There are basically different studies from different groups. There's a US group, British group, Italian group. There's a Japanese group, Korean. So among all these groups, there are the percentages what I have quoted here may vary among different groups. But in general, we remember that anti-NXP2 in adults has a higher risk of cancer. In children, the cancer of, uh, risk is lesser. However, anti-NXP2 is common also in juvenile dermatomyositis. The thera therapeutic response is also good. Anti-MDA5, generally we call it CADM, that is clinically amyopathic dermatomyositis. So the skin is more involved in muscle. They may also be amyopathic also. Skin ulcers on the palms are typically seen in these patients and they have rapidly progressive ILD. So this subset of patients may never come to us. They may go to dermatologists or they may go to a pulmonologist with rapidly progressive ILD and they respond to steroids. However, they may rapidly progress and also they may have early death within a year of the diagnosis. But almost about 30 to 50% of them die within the first year. And anti-TIF1 gamma, uh, this is also known to have an increased risk of malignancy. So MDA5, I told increased risk of uh, rapidly progressive interstitial lung disease. Anti-TIF1 gamma is for increased risk of malignancy seen in both adult and juvenile dermatomyositis. However, the increased risk of malignancy is more in the adults. Again, these percentages vary between different groups what you study, whether it is Japanese or Korean or US group or British. So just remember the key points what are to come from this slide. And anti-SAE has mainly skin manifestations. So anti-MI2, I told you, it has muscle plus skin. Muscle is milder, has a favorable prognosis, less common ILD, good response to therapy. Basically, it is involved in transcription. Uh, so just to uh, have a recall, uh, there's skin changes, there's muscle weakness here you see, and the hyperpigmentation on the face you can see here. This patient was also negative for malignancy by PET MRI. I'm trying to show the Gordon papules in this case. Uh, of course, you can see the skin changes, there is weakness, there is some mild contracture or also the Gotrans papules, what you see here, and MI2B was strongly positive. Similar other patient with skin changes in MI2B. So this is, I'm just showing the calcinosis. The patient had thick skin over the uh, gluteal region. And here you see, this is the bone and this is the calcinosis, which is seen in this patient. Okay. So cancer associated, mostly it is TIF1 gamma. The ca common cancers are gynec, lung, breast cancers, etc. TIF1 gamma, again, is involved in many cellular pathways in tissue differentiation. It can have skin manifestations like soria form lesions, uh, verica like papules, hyperkeratotic skin lesions. However, the presence of other uh, comorbid conditions like Raynaud's arthritis, calcinosis, ILD is rare here, but most commonly we see malignancy. 
So if you have TIF1 gamma, the sensitivity and specificity in adults of picking the malignancy is as high as this. This is an important point from clinical point of view. Next is anti-NXP2. Uh, again, uh, about, out of all the dermatomyositis, uh, this may be about 20 to 25%. It is also involved in transcriptional uh, modification. The spectrum in children is calcinosis and in adults is cancer. Cancer in children is rare. This is a capillaroscopy from a patient with uh, NXP2. We see dilated capillaries, occasional bleeds, and the reduced capillary density in this patient. So muscle MRI, we see this is a stir sequence. It's just important to remember a stir sequence is required to pick up edema. We are seeing here hyper intensities in the, in the anterior group of muscles and in the gluteal muscles here. This is another patient I showed, I told you NXP2 can have calcinosis. So you see in the axillary area here, in the elbow area, in this X-ray, there's some calcium deposition. So next is MTMDA, MDA5, first identified in Japan. Uh, you have to remember that it has mostly, it comes as CADM, clinically amyopathic dermatomyositis. And the most important thing is rapidly progressive ILD. It usually has poor prognosis with death of almost 30 to 50% at one year. And the next one is anti-SAE. Like I told you, it's associated with skin manifestations and also can be seen with dysphagia. It is less common in the Asian cohort. So this is a table, if you have to tell, you can subclassify the autoantibodies in dermatomyositis. You can tell briefly about the function, then see, tell whether it is adult or juvenile onset. So I told you two different gamma NXP2 can be adult or juvenile. CK very high here. So remember muscle involvement is quite prominent in MI2 and in NXP2. Skin involvement is quite severe in MDA5. That's why we call it CADM. And lung involvement, it is rapidly progressive ILD is more common in MDA5. So this table just summarizes as an important table for you to write in your paper. So you will co cover the uh, age at onset, the CK, and the involvement by the organs, muscle, skin, lung, joint, and cancer. These are the five important uh, system involvement we have to look for. Coming to the next group, so I told you IIM, idiopathic inflammatory myositis, we are classified as dermatomyositis and as antiseptitase syndromes. So here most common is JO1 and this is what, uh, this was the first described antibody also and this is probably the only antibody which is used in the EULA classification so far. So typically we have myositis, we have Raynaud's phenomenon like seen in this, there is, arthri there is arthritis, there is interstitial lung disease, and this is the mechanic hands, the thickened, cracked hands, cracked skin, particularly at the fingertips. So these five things you have to remember in any patient with antisynthetase syndromes because these are commonly seen in this condition. So in antisynthetase, we have Jovan, which is common, comes with myositis, ILD, fever, mechanics hands, Raynaud's, and arthralgias. PL12, PL7, we have different studies. However, they were mostly, they have interstitial lung disease. Um, which is more common than myositis. In others also, like I told you, there, is, they can, there can be association with uh, some amount of uh, systemic sclerosis, dysphagia, etc. So most of these are targeted against class two antisynthesis. And the typical clinical features you have to remember in this subgroup. So presence of Jovan is a strong predictor of clinical improvement. So this is another patient with anti-OJ. You can see the skin lesions in this patient. She has a weakness of the neck and also the proximal upper limb. Treated with pulse IVMP and there's quite a good improvement, though not complete. CK here you see is not very high, is almost normal. So some of these patients can come as chronic muscle diseases. However, you can pick up by the, by the associated arthritis or by associated mechanic hands or renal phenomenon, et cetera. Coming to the immune-mediated necrotizing myopathy autoantibodies. So two, one, two uh, important antibodies, anti-HMG-CR and anti-SRP. So only two thirds will have antibodies in this subgroup. The remaining one third can be antibody negative in the pathologically proven necrotizing myopathies. So HMG-CR, most important thing, we know that it is associated with statin exposure. So generally, adults will have history of statin exposure. However, it can also come like a LGMD-like presentation. So it's a it can come like a chronic presentation. You do genetics, there is no mutation. However, if you check antibodies, some of them may have anti-HMG-CR. It is less common in our cohort, but however, it is more common in the US cohort. 
there is also increased risk of cancer slightly and there is no ild the prognosis at 4 years about 85% recovered in this study other antibody here is anti srp it has more severe weakness more necrosis and biopsy they can have axial weakness dropped head dysphagia extra muscular symptoms they have can also have cardiac involvement they may recover slower like i said here in this uh, study at 4 years only 50% recovered and uh, among this imnm they can be a zero negative group also so almost one third of the people can be zero negative remember that hmg cr can come like chronic like lgmd and srp may be refracted to treatment you have to treat for a very long time or with other immunomodulating agents before you decide, before you give up on this patients so the same thing again i classified as muscle lung skin so we know both of them have severe muscle involvement both anti srp and hmg cr and lung and skin are mild or none so anti srp frequency in iim it is 5% and it causes severe necrotizing myopathy so usually they are refracted to conventional therapy they respond poorly to b cell depletion um, however prolonged treatment is essential to have some recovery like in this patient who this is a partly follow up uh, this is after after some time of follow up the patient was actually bed bound and severely wasted at the time of initial presentation he had proximal weakness neck weakness however on almost about a year he has some improvement you can see the limb is better here and this is after few months post treatment uh, you can see the weakness here has completely almost completely recovered so this is another anti srp they have mechanics hands you can see the cracked feet and the on the skin changes in the feet here these are the muscle changes basically you look at fatty atrophy and also at the edema in these tar sequences the fat suppressed tar sequences where you are looking at the edema in these muscles so some of these have prominent facial involvement some may not have facial involvement pet mri again shows uptake in the same regions where you see the muscle hyperintensity coming to the next antibody that is anti hmg cr is as common as 64% in the necrotizing myopathy subgroup which is histologically proven necrotizing myopathy they target the 3 hydroxy 3 methyl glutaryl coa reductase enzyme that is involved in the cholesterol synthesis pathway again remember muscle weakness elevated ck myopathic changes and they respond to treatment this is in the pathway of the anti hmg cr where so mostly you see it in state in use but it can present like lgmd so how do we test usually uh, uh, previously when they were studied they used the immuno precipitation method to study all this antibodies however now commonly what we use is the myocyte uraline myositis antigen profile immuno blot qualitative method however you always uh, a check with iif method that is a indirect immunofluorescence method for interference pattern the specificity range is from 97 to 100% but most of the previous articles they have used the immuno precipitation method for detecting these antibodies so coming briefly about treatment acute stage most of them we treat with glucocorticoids unless there is a contraindication where we use ivig or rituximab then we follow up them with methotrexate or azathioprine or casneurin inhibitors uh, which we don't commonly use then mycophenolate or rituximab so you see muscle skin ild arthritis most of them respond well to glucocorticoids and methotrexate however and rituximab also however when casneurin inhibitors when we use some of them may not respond well and we can also use uh, hydroxychloroquine for uh, rash in dermatomyositis which i have not covered here so mainly we are we will be using uh, glucocorticoids mt uh, mycophenolate azathioprine uh, and uh, rituximab IVIG, of course, when you cannot give steroids to a patient, suppose uh, patient has coexisting uh, fungal infection or any other contraindication, that is when we commonly use because it is an expensive drug. So, just briefly, I will summarize now. I have covered MI two uh, with mu muscle. MI two has skin. MDA five comes with mostly skin disease, and these anti-syncytial syndromes come with all this mechanics, hands, Raynaud's arthritis. plus muscle plus lung malignancy you remember to these two antibodies nxp2 and tif1 gamma and for calcinosis mostly it is nxp2 both of these with necrotizing myopathy and srp with severe myopathy and dysphagia and refractory to treatment so conclude to conclude msas are highly specific for diagnosis they are associated with a unique clinical subset of uh, this dermatomyositis or polymyositis or necrotizing myopathies they useful biomarkers 
there has been a significant progress in the number of msas which are discovered in the last 10 years we still don't have them in the diagnostic criteria however they are very useful to clinically prognosticate or uh, to find out if a, uh, to find to find, look for complications in a particular patient so new immunoassays will become more widely available for clinical practice yes. like to conclude here thank you the important references is lancet article from 2018 which talks about the classification and management of adult inflammatory myopathy is quite extensive i think this is enough for our reference excellent saraswati you covered so much uh, in around 16 17 minutes i think you managed to you know touch everything in the antibodies fantastic thank you, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it was quite uh, exhaustive lectures there. Thank you, everybody. I think there were a couple of uh, doubts which we managed to clear. I thank all my uh, speaker panel for giving their valuable time and uh, so much hard work they have put in into these difficult lectures. Thank you very much and uh, good night. Thank you. And I thank everybody. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night.